Now we have the pleasure to listen uh, to the last talk of, of uh, our little workshop and delivered by Christian Edison. I'll give you a short overview or a short introduction to him as a persona and researcher. So Christian Edison is professor at Aalborg University since 2019. And his research interests <clears throat> are or lie in the uh, areas of educational psychological testing on the one hand, and um, in the global educational institutions on the other. In one of his later research programs, um, he is looking at education assessment under the reign of testing and, and inclusion, and is trying to identify potential fields of tension, as well as paradoxa, etc. Prior to his current position, he has been a visiting scholar at Edinburgh twice, the University of Birmingham, and the University of Oxford and has published, if I remember correctly, more than 140 book chapters, uh, journal articles and books, so taken all together. Today we have the great pleasure to listening to his talk uh, entitled Restoring Research in Education, Paradigms, Governing Complexes, Emancipation, which is also his inaugural lecture, which he's going to deliver later today. So thank you for taking time to talk to and with us. And we're really, really looking forward to your lecture, or in this case, talk. And um, yeah, uh, please welcome everybody with a warm digital um, hello, Mr. Christian Edison. Yeah, thank you very much, Till, for that kind introduction. And uh, hello, everyone, and thanks for... Uh, for logging in and listening to this uh, little talk. I hope you get something out of it. I understand you already had a, a, a dense program, but uh, nevertheless, I'll do my best to, uh, to capture your attention and hopefully we can have um, some discussion uh, afterwards. Uh, for starters, I will just uh, share my screen so that you can see my slides. Can you see my screen? Good, good, okay. Yeah, okay, so Till already mentioned the, the title here. Um, so let me just uh, jump into it. Um, imagine your local school that you enter the front door and you uh, come across this uh, notice board. Uh, in schools notice boards, you will uh, often find very different programs, different, uh, different initiatives, different, um, different agendas, so to speak, hanging on the uh, notice board. Uh, now these agendas, they may be something about uh, neuroscience, like you can see here, John's brain, uh, the amygdala. It could be something about raising attainment. It could be something about Bildung. Uh, it could be something about personal growth or the well-being of the class and, and so on and so forth. So all these sort of programs are, uh, and initiatives are sort of imposing themselves on, on uh, schools, on teachers, on school leaders. And uh, to be honest, you know, they are not always congruent. They are not always aligned or they may draw attention or draw education into different uh, directions. So one way of uh, sort of peeling the onion or as, at least sort of scratching the surface of what's behind these programs is to look at education purposes because quite often you would see that uh, they are um, aligned with different purposes. So here I have created this little model where you can uh, see why education. So one purpose of education could be very much about the labor market. Um, another purpose could be very much about personal development or the, the Bildung dimension, you could say. And then uh, on the uh, X axis here, you could uh, talk about perhaps a tension between universalism and uh, the, the more national interest. So, if, for instance, you try to plot in some, some key programs, you have the PISA program in the top uh, right corner, where very, very much about the labor market and the competences for the labor market of tomorrow. And that is, of course, a very universalist uh, program claiming that it's the same 
uh, competences that are needed uh, regardless of where you are in the world. Um, on the other, uh, opposite that, uh, there could be something about the creation of the national citizen, the re-emergence of nationalism, um, the national standards and curriculum. We could also plot in the sustainable development goals, which are sort of quite, quite a lot about also personal development, but even so they are very sort of universalist in that sense. So it, that, that's just one way of perhaps approaching uh, this uh, quite, uh, to be honest, chaotic landscape, you might say. Because what I argue is that these four purposes here, a labor market, personal development, nation or universalism, are implicitly or explicitly expressed in education policies and they're built into schooling practice and with varying degrees and means promoted by different stakeholders around the world. Now, you may rightly ask, well, are you, are you talking about the global education or wh what context am I actually talking about here? Well, it might be a, seen as a quite Western approach perhaps, but the point here is that these purposes are exported globally via international organizations and transnational poli policy diffusions, uh, that is in defining education programs with a global reach. So in one way or the other, these purposes behind these programs are sort of enforced onto the world in, in, on a global um, level. I'm going to come back to what the implications are of that uh, later. Um, on a more general uh, note, we could say that in an age of globalization and neoliberalism, competition among students and countries has led to greater standardization in education and the narrowing of educational aims. So there is some kind of movement in this chart here, you could say, and that has shifted the purpose of schooling from learning for learning's sake towards more econo economically driven and uh, competitive aims. So that was just sort of a, a starting point. Uh, so the structure of this uh, talk is then to try to make first a diagnosis of the contemporary education uh, triangle between research, policy, and practice. So what are the challenges of the contemporary situation? Then I move on to say something about state-of-the-art literature, uh, how has it been dealt with in the state-of-the-art literature, and then I'm gonna uh, introduce this idea about the governing complex. Uh, the third part is uh, briefly about historical paradigms and their appearances. And I identify three paradigms, a paradigm where efficiency, optimization, ec economistic thinking and accountability structures take pride of place and a paradigm focused on the conditions and transformative potentials of education, often understood as human development, flourishing and emancipation, perhaps even. And then there's also a, a paradigm revolving around biological ideas about the human body, the brain, human ability, how education and society can be organized to naturally reflect such ideas. And finally, I'm going to say something about emancipatory potentials and the paths ahead. So in, in part one, uh, if we look at the, the challenges here for policy and schooling, it is clear that when we look at this landscape of education programs, they are uh, all in their sense connected with particular ideas and approaches, and they may sometimes have um, detrimental effects when they are rolled out in large scale because they have limited, reductionist, or even amputated relevant in local context. Now, some examples of these challenges are uh, international large-scale comparative assessments programs, uh, which often tend to have amputated concerns for national and local context. And in that sense, they may reflect distorted or even irrelevant results or rankings. They tend very often to say all other things being equal, meaning uh, that they don't regard context as any uh, having any kind of, uh, of relevance. Another example is the implementation of so-called you know, I mean, fashionable and one-sided education policies in pursuit of specific goals. It could be, for instance, the 21st century skills and competencies agenda. It could also perhaps be the STEM agenda. The point here is that as soon as there's something being canonized, a lot of other things are sort of falling between chairs. Uh, 
and not uh, and, and and not being deemed as as relevant. And in that sense, there's this danger that it sort of amputates um, education as as a phenomenon. Uh, a third and more uh, perhaps uh, individualized um, uh, challenge is the off-rolling of students from school found to be volatile in terms of improving test scores. Now, the point here is that um, when, uh, for instance, school leaders uh, get a bonus for uh, improving test scores, there, becomes, there arises a very strong incentive for you know, uh, off-rolling students from the school protocol uh, because they're not really helpful for the school. They are not assets to the school. Uh, and that is uh, very counterproductive to, to, to uh, at least some of the purposes of uh, education. So um, I argue here that education policy and schooling practice are actually torn under the impact of all these various programs, technologies and interests and that they are legitimated by knowledge paradigms and that uh, which promote different agendas and, and priorities. So uh, that was the challenge for education and schooling. So if we then look at education research, um, quite often uh, decision makers, policy makers and practitioners, um, they look to education research because they seek for a source that can provide knowledge, data, and evidence that can be used to gain orientation, legitimation, and traction for policies and schooling, sort of um, helping them decide what's up and down in all of this. But the problem is that education research itself is permeated by all these knowledge paradigms and as such an equally fragmented field because we have differing research ideals, we have differing approaches, we have diverse institutional contexts, we have for instance, universities, international organizations, think tanks, sector research institutions, consultancy firms, and edu businesses with their own research departments. So the implication is that what is labeled as education research is actually a very slippery concept and very closely entangled with some of the same agendas, interests, priorities, and technologies as what we've seen with other stakeholders in education. So, um, Bourdieu, uh, in, 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 a, in a publication from 2006, uh, or at least it came out in 2006, observed how the um, autonomy of science, which science used to enjoy over the religious, political and economic power, as well as state bureaucracies, has been severely weakened meaning that both science is in danger and also that science has become dangerous in a way. Um, so we could say when we look at education research, particularly that on one hand, it's increasingly propelled towards being the servant of externally defined purposes, impacts and legitimations. And on the other hand, it's parad paradigmatically intertwined with understandings and imaginaries about the purposes of education found in the fields of policy and schooling. So it means actually that education research as a, as a field, varied and fragmented as it is, is unable to offer knowledge to remedy these tumultuous and conflicting conditions in policy and schooling. So what I basically argue is there's an, a very urgent need to revisit and restore education research to rebuild education research as a transparent platform that will make it possible to see options more clearly and improve its ability to serve the needs of the public in the 21st century. Transparency is absolutely key here because that's really what is lacking in many ways. So how do we deal with this situation? Um, well, I'm not going to deny that I'm a historian of education, so it's I will propose to look to history. So that's why I included this picture uh, of the news Clio. Um, so because what I uh, want to, to suggest is that we um, identify and explore the historical trajectories and manifestations of key knowledge paradigms from the foundation of the modern educational sciences in the interwar years to the state of the art contemporary programs in education. Working with such a historical lens, I argue, serves to create an analytical distance from education research as a research object uh, 
while hopefully also avoiding being trapped in the investigated knowledge paradigms. It is about creating a room for critical reflection, a critical distance to education research as a research object um, in itself. I argue that a historical perspective can provide uh, a critical awareness of how and why contemporary education has come to function and be understood as it is, and at the same time enable us to reflect on lost opportunities and unexplored paths and to problematize accepted truths. In other words, the historical perspective can create a platform for critical reflection about the present because it offers an awareness of the contingencies and the lost possibles of the past. That is always the optimism of the historian whenever we have come to a difficult or problematic situation is to say, well, I can just assure you that it's not gonna stay this way. And that's one thing for, sure, for certain. So I will now uh, move to part two about state of the art literature and the introduction of the concept of governing complexes. When we look at state of the art uh, and the literature, um, scholars have used very diverse analytical terms to understand the globalization of education policy. So we find concepts like policy diffusion, policy borrowing, policy transfer, policy traveling, policy convergence, recontextualization, reference societies, deterritorialization, policy scapes, globalized localisms and instrument constituencies. So we have a very, very rich and varied uh, nomenclature that are being put to use in, um, in, in education policy uh, research. Um, to sum up, the key insight from state-of-the-art literature on global governance in education is that it's necessary to study the interactions and overlaps between international, national and local contexts and the entanglements of a host of actors to acquire an adequate understanding of policy and schooling uh, practice developments. Um, contemporary education policy research makes the very important point that education reform agendas should not be viewed as top-down in positions, but rather as iterative constructions across various actors and pressures that could have commonalities at the international level, but which are more varied at the national and local levels. So um, it, it, it really just adds a lot to the, to the complexity here, but it is a very complex uh, thing to, to, to investigate. And that's also why I was sort of, um, drawn to the development of this idea about the governing complex. Um, the interesting thing about this concept is that it, it has this sort of Janus face uh, uh, orientation, uh, this double-sidedness. So there's an, an empirical analytical orientation and a critical analytical orientation. So if we first look at what a complex really is, uh, this is like just a, a dictionary um, definition, uh, a complex is a whole, comprehending in its compass a number of parts, um, of interconnected parts or involved particulars. It's a complex or complicated whole as such. So the term then allows for the interconnectedness and the complexities of an organized structure made of, up of parts. So we can actually take in then organizations, authorities, agents, technologies, discourses, materialities, as well as the knowledge, data, and evidence floating between these parts. So the object of explanation then is the governance workings and implications of such a political machinery, you could call it. That is how shifts in governance or governing produce and reflect shifts in, in knowledge. Um, now, this governing dimension is viewed as something that emerges in the configuration of relations between the entities, but also in the relational exchanges between entities in this organized structure. So that is the, the, um, the empirical uh, part. So when we look at the critical uh, analytical orientation, um, the duality of the concept of, of complex means that it also has this sort of 
psychological meaning. Um, and here the definition is that a complex is a related group of repressed or partly repressed emotionally significant ideas which cause psychic conflict leading to abnormal mental states or behavior. So this understanding of complex then feeds our understanding of the sometimes paradoxical and even perverse workings and outcomes of governing complexes in education. These workings and outcomes, as I, uh, I gave you some examples before, but they result from the competing agendas that are then associated with the different stakeholders, priorities, discursive struggles that we often find in education policies, especially when we study them critically across the local, the regional, the national, the transnational and the global perspective. So this concept of governing complex um, uh, also implies that we add knowledge, data and evidence to the equation of the, the complex. Uh, and that gives the concept the potential to include education research as the producer of knowledge, data and evidence as a significant entity on the same level as the other parts in the organized structure. So the concept of governing complex insists on bringing the interactions between education research, policy and schooling practice under one analytical lens. And at the same time, it has this sort of historical um, dimension to it because it views governing complex as as historical and floating configuration and they offer insights into a reservoir of commonalities and analogies between the past and the present as well as the contingencies that shape historical change and is imposed both temporal and explanatory order on on the contemporary governing complexes so that was the theoretical part now I'm going to be more specific uh, in uh, teasing out some of the paradigms or the key paradigms in education and how they have manifested themselves uh, across uh, history. So what I basically argue is that there are these three paradigms, the economistic evidence and what works paradigm. We have the biologistic genetics and ability paradigm, and we have the idealistic rights and emancipation paradigm. And how did I identify these paradigms? Well, uh, as it says here on, on the left, uh, it's from my, my reading uh, of the research literature on contemporary and historical education policy. And that, that's, and also of course, the empirical work that I've done in archives and so on, uh, makes me argue that we have the presence of these three longue durée knowledge paradigms um, and that these paradigms are shaped by different ideas and imaginaries about the very purposes of education. So in this sense, there is a, there is a relation to this um, initial step that I presented about the purposes of, of education. Now, these knowledge paradigms materialize in the produced knowledge, data and evidence, and they feed into the policies, programs and technology. So these are really what's interesting to, to, to analyze on the step towards understanding the workings of the governing complexes. And perhaps some of you may wonder, so the economistic evidence and what works paradigms, that's sort of on top of the other two. And, um, and that's not a coincidence. It is because this economistic uh, style of reasoning is very um, powerful and actually to some extent also determining some of these other uh, paradigms, at least uh, they have to, to navigate or relate to or position themselves in relation to the uh, economistic uh, paradigm. So to, um, to tease out more clearly these um, paradigms, if we start then with the economistic evidence and what works paradigm, um, this paradigm revolves around the desire to regulate the population and society in general and the economy and economic growth in particular. So it is essentially a very instrumental reasoning that's often guided by ideals about development and modernization. And I included here the front cover of the uh, conference proceedings from uh, one of the first OECD um, conferences on education. And I think the the title here is very telling, namely Policy Conference on Economic Growth and Investment in Education. So 
you can very clearly here see the sort of wedding between the economy and education or education as a production factor. Now about this modernization idea, um, Gilman in his uh, famous book from 2003 called Mandarins of the Future notes how the key attributes of modernization theory were its global aspirations in terms of scope and in terms of content that bureaucracies, technical experts, social engineers of various stripes should impose economic and political order on cities, nations and the world. So also here already, um, this is a historical analysis. So uh, looking at the uh, immediate post-war years, there you already have this sort of imposition of this way of thinking uh, on a global uh, scale. So if we go back to the purpose of education within this paradigm, then it is to deliver an apt and educated workforce with the right competences for the labor market. That is essentially also what's called human capital theory. Uh, if we look at research, it becomes clear that we have data, statistics, standards, and benchmarks. They are important tools for regulation and for making individuals, organizations, and institutions comparable. And it's often guided by ideals about the optimization, modernization, and development of society. Now, um, just to, to, to give you an idea of the sort of historical flow of this paradigm, we may even go, uh, we, we, we can actually, I could actually go all the way back to, to John Locke, at least, and Adam Smith, but I, I, I chose to, to, to make a little stop here at the famous uh, economist, Alfred Marshall's textbook from 1890, in which he talks about uh, that we may conclude that the wisdom of expending public and private funds in education is not to be measured by its direct fruits alone, it will be profitable as a mere investment to give the masses of the people much greater opportunities than they can generally avail themselves of. For by this means, many who would have died unknown are unable to get the start needed for bringing out their latent abilities. So he talks very much about investing in education and not that edu education is not just uh, spending money, but it's, it's an investment in, in, in the population that will, will create um, economic uh, growth. And this whole idea about the optimization uh, ideal becomes very clear in the uh, immediate post-war years where we have the RAND Corporation Research and Development, which was used to be part of, of the Douglas Aircraft Corporation, so actually part of the US military. They started to look at education. And um, I have a little quote here from one of their key reports from 1959, talking about if one decided to increase ability to read by a specified amount, a successful study could show which of several possible systems was best, that is cost the least. So this whole optimization uh, idea. And perhaps most recently, I found this very, very recent uh, research article, and I think it's all in the title uh, because this article is called Application of the Data-Driven Educational Decision-Making System to Curriculum Optimization of Higher Education. So clearly, this is a paradigm that's still with us uh, and with very, very powerful implications. The second paradigm is what I call the Idealistic Rights and Emancipation Paradigm. The ideals guiding this paradigm are humanistic and universalist ideals. We have human rights, sustainability, social justice, and we have inclusive, equitable, quality education, along with lifelong learning opportunities for all. Um, and the front cover here is the front cover from the UNESCO's Global Education Monitoring Report from 2017. Um, this paradigm is essentially uh, a critical and normative approach guided by a focus on the political and emancipatory nature of education often with an inherent ambition to empower and equip students to lead rich and fulfilling lives. Education here is seen as a vehicle for molding, changing, improving, evolving, even revolutionizing society or the world, but also a side of power that can be used positively for empowerment and emancipation or negatively to subdue and oppress. Uh, and here we might think of uh, the famous uh, pedagogy of the oppressed by Freya as one example of this kind of critical 
uh, type of education uh, research. Uh, so in terms of research, this paradigm often surfaces in normative and critical analysis, taking various starting points in ideals about the world in general and education in particular. The main driver here is the improvement of education and the conditions for stakeholders in the uh, premise of education itself, rather than serving purposes external to education. Some examples here, well, I, I, I mean, there are, there are multiple examples, but I decided to just include here some of the early UNESCO programs, Education for Peace programs. Um, that was one of the, the, the key topics on UNESCO's agenda right from, uh, from the outset. Um, so essentially, the idea here is that education must be reshaped so as to fit men and women to live peacefully together. That's the core um, agenda of, uh, of UNESCO. And then we have the biologistic genetics and ability paradigm. Um, the core idea in this paradigm um, are the evolutionary progress of humankind and that the human body and its traits and abilities constitute a, like a nodal point for education activities and planning. The idea is that education practices and theories can be scientifically deduced from knowledge about nature, that is the human body and brain. And here I uh, included a, a couple of, of pictures. So um, the one is the front cover of the 2013 uh, book by Catherine Asbury and Robert Plowman uh, called G is for Genes. And again, the subtitle is very telling, the impact of genetics on education and achievement. And in the, the, the smaller picture here is uh, Theodore Simon, uh, the, um, the assistant of uh, Binet, who was uh, you know, the, the, the father of IQ testing, you might say. So here, uh, Theodore Simon is uh, measuring um, a child. Um, so this paradigm clearly has a very long history, going back to phrenology, the eugenics movement, the practices of IQ testing, it has recently that now resurfaced in neurobiology, neuroscience, neuropedagogy. Um, that is the translation of research findings on neural mechanisms in the brain uh, to education practice and policy, and also the other way around to understand the effects of education on the brain. So according to this paradigm, the purpose of education is to align education policy and schooling with what is biologically determined and possible and put everyone in their right place in society. Regarding research, this paradigm in education has been heavily influenced by science disciplines such as psychology, genetics, and neurobiology, and it then becomes essentially like an amalgam of psychometrics and what we now call the life sciences. And the, the, Polish, the famous Polish uh, sociologist uh, Sigmund Bauman epitomizes this paradigm when he wrote about the modern gardening state, viewing the society it rules as an object of designing, cultivating and weed poisoning. Some examples here. Well, these first couple of excerpts uh, come from my um, archival research I did in Birmingham back in 2013, actually. And here it says, um, yeah, it's, it's from the school medical officer in, in Birmingham, these annual reports that uh, he wrote. And uh, he talks about how some interesting work has been carried out in the United States, which suggests that it may be possible in certain cases to raise intelligence quotients by administering glutamic acid over a period of about six months. Although this in investigation is still in an experimental stage, there seems sufficient evidence to justify its use and its hope to explore the possibilities of this treatment in Birmingham. And also he talks about how sometimes it's the duty for the medical officer following upon reports from the head teacher of the special school and the education psychologist and after carrying out mental tests to recommend that a child shall be permanently excluded as ineducable. Um, and then uh, moving fast forward to uh, a, a quote here from Dominic Cummings, who was uh, a, a key policy advisor to number 10 Downing Street. Um, he talks about 
how work by one of the pioneers of behavioral genetics, Robert Plowman, has shown that most of the variation in performance of children in English schools is accounted for uh, by within school factors, that is not between school factors, of which the largest factor is genes, actually. And uh, Plowman himself talks about how life is an intelligence test. During the school years, differences in intelligence are largely the reason why some children master the curriculum more readily than other children. So I think the, the eugenics uh, style of reasoning is very, um, comes, comes very clearly to the fore here. So let's look at the, some emancipatory potentials and perhaps the path ahead. So if we move uh, try to move beyond these paradigms, as I've argued that we should try to do. I want to start with a couple of uh, philosophical insights. The first one here from the uh, social liberal philosopher, John Stuart Mill, uh, who talks about how the tendency has always been strong to believe that whatever received a name must be an entity or thing having an independent existence of its own. And if no real entity answering to the name could be found, men did not for that reason suppose that none existed, but imagined that it was something peculiarly abstruse and mysterious, too high to be an object of sense. So it says very much about our um, relation, you could say, with concepts. And uh, just because we talk about a thing like intelligence or ability or genes or whatever it is we we we, we talk about, um, we quickly get a certain sort of view on what that is actually. And uh, it sometimes it's very hard for people to problematize that. So I think this is little quote here is an important reminder. Um, and uh, there's also a quote here from Deleuze and, and Guterri who talks about how concepts are not waiting for us, ready-made like heavenly bodies. There's no heaven for concepts. They must be invented, fabricated, or rather created, and would be nothing without their creator's signature. So um, what I want to say with these two quotes is really that um, the dismantling of the transcendentalism of the paradigms that I have just uh, presented to you offers an emancipatory potential. Um, and my suggestion for, for, for doing that is really to I mean, you could look at this like kind of a, a recipe for like a research program that that you start with identifying some key education programs. You could do that historically, interwar, post-war, contemporary, and then sort of try to scratch the surface a little bit, peel the onion, look at the purposes of education. So where are these, pro what kind of uh, orientation do these programs have? And that is sort of like an analytical entry point into the knowledge paradigms where you can actually see, so this is a particular manifestation of this kind of a, a knowledge paradigm. And once we've done that, we can actually look at how these knowledge paradigms have informed the governing complex as the governing complex is understood as the triangle between research, policy, and schooling practices. So that's why there's like an analytical and methodological movement with an arrow downwards on the left side. And then on the right side, we have, we sort of come back uh, again from having analyzed the governing complexes. And then we will see these programs from which we started our analysis in a new light. And hopefully they should be more transparent and more sort of um, clear in terms of what their implications really are. So then moving education research forward, we can then uh, identify these governing complexes. And as I said, you know, they, they emerge in the intersections between institutions, organizations, actors, agendas, technologies, ideologies, and the paradigms. So we need to have all that in place, which we can have if we sort of follow this recipe, because these governing complexes are the ones that come together to order and classify context, then we get this, an explanation for how they work. And that then uh, in the next step, create transparency about the role and usage of education research in the governance of policies and schooling practice. So history of education is one way of achieving this. It's one way of achieving a critical reflective space for decision makers, stakeholders and researchers. 
So it becomes like a reservoir for teasing out the antecedents, the stepping stones, the conditions, the trajectories, and, and the transparency vis-a-vis -vis contemporary policies, practices, and technologies. For instance, we can argue the presence of a historical trajectory going back to World War II, which was shaped during the bipolar world order of the Cold War, and which laid the foundation for the crucial role of numbers, data, and indicators that we see today. Uh, concretely, we see um, that how the Sputnik shock would really put education on the agenda, but education of a certain kind, namely the training of engineers and technical personnel, later on the development of indicators, um, the um, nation at risk report from 1983, uh, feeding into the creation of the international indicator program in the OECD, which was again, the precursor of the PISA program. So in that sense, it's possible to, to establish this kind of, of trajectory. So um, what I really argue and the, the reason why I'm, I'm proposing all this is really to, uh, to, to make it possible for decision makers, stakeholders and researchers in education to be aware of these par paradigms and not least also their possibilities and limitations and empower them to actually ask the question, which solutions do education programs, practices and policies imply and are they relevant in a given context? Um, so the point is really to empower the stakeholders of education and at the same time restore an old virtue of research, namely that of transparency and critical reflection, something that I to a large extent uh, think seems to have been lost. So thank you very much for your attention.